Hello friends, this is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN merch button click on that it'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that hey on the swag that i'm using it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear sports history network and my favorite podcaster the sports history network store shop there today this podcast is part of the sports history network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport you can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com Hi folks, uh, welcome to another episode of Pro Football in the 1970s. I'm your host, Joe Zagorski, and in this episode, we're going to talk about the Denver Broncos' first ever playoff game. It was certainly a long wait, but in 1977, the wait was finally over. The Denver Broncos came into existence in the old American Football League back in 1960. A total of 18 years later, in 1977, Pro Football's Rocky Mountain team finally made the playoffs. They had suffered through many losing seasons and once in a rare while, a mediocre season or two. But that 1977 season was certainly glorious as the Broncos indeed made it all the way to Super Bowl XII. But before they could go to the biggest game of the year, Denver would have to first handle the Pittsburgh Steelers at Mile High Stadium in the AFC Divisional Playoffs. It would be the very first postseason game in the team's history, and even though it is largely forgotten today, it would be celebrated because it was their initial playoff contest and their first playoff victory. The date was December 24, 1977. The Broncos had entered the playoff tournament with their best record ever, 12-2, which also happened to be the best record in the league, and Mark tied that of the Dallas Cowboys and they would eventually meet the Cowboys in Super Bowl XII, as you know. Denver's orange crush defense was the unit which led the way to the postseason. They had surrendered a meager 148 points all season long, a mark that was good enough for third best in the NFL. In the eighth week of that season, Denver did meet Pittsburgh for the very first taste of what the Steelers brought to the table. The Broncos won that meeting 21-7, proving that they were able to handle the pressure against a top-tier opponent. But the playoffs were something different, however, and this would be the very first playoff contest that Denver had ever experienced. Now that's pressure. The Broncos did have a statistic that uh, was firmly on their side from the regular season on, however. They had only given up 57 points in the second half of their previous 14 games, which stood out as impressive proof that their new head coach, Red Miller, and his assistants were able to make strong halftime adjustments. In their playoff contest game against the Steelers, the Broncos would once again have to rely on their ability to make some alterations to their offensive and defensive game plans at halftime. The game was a seesaw affair, where the first three touchdowns by one team were answered equally by a touchdown from the other team. Denver wasted no time in scoring in the first quarter of their first ever playoff game. In fact, all throughout the game, the Broncos were the beneficiaries of their stalwart defensive play. The Orange Crush defense, as it was known, forced the Pittsburgh uh, offense into committing four turnovers, each of which occurred in Steelers' territory. Having a shorter field with which to deal with, Uh, Denver's offense was practically assured of putting at least some points on the scoreboard. A blocked punt led to rookie Broncos running back Rob Lytle's score as he ran straight up the gut practically untouched from seven yards out to post a 7-0 Broncos lead. Pittsburgh answered in kind as they successfully finished a scoring drive in the second quarter with a one-yard Terry Bradshaw quarterback sneak. Denver wasted no time in responding, however, as all-pro linebacker Tom Jackson returned a Steelers fumble 30 yards. From there, Broncos halfback Otis Armstrong ran 10 yards to Pater, reclaimed the lead 14-7. 
Just before halftime, the Steelers answered back with a one-yard Franco Harris run. The two teams were deadlocked as they entered their locker rooms at the half. Now, as both teams left the field, Denver head coach Red Miller had a few caustic comments for the game officials and then for Steelers head coach Chuck Knoll and for Steelers defensive line coach George Perlis. Their subsequent argument was ignited when all-pro Pittsburgh defensive tackle Mean Joe Green punched Denver offensive guard Paul Howard in the solar plexus after one play had ended. I think Mean Joe knew what he was doing at that time when he punched people in stomachs. Green's punch was precipitated by Howard, whom Green claimed was regularly holding him on several plays in the first half. The referees failed to observe Green's punch, but on the very next play, they did observe Green punching Denver sender Mike Motler in the stomach. Green was therefore penalized 15 yards for unsportsmanlike conduct, because punching somebody in the stomach is supposedly against the rules in the NFL. Miller was first, he first complained to the referees that Green should have been penalized more than he was. Miller then went after Chuck Nolan, George Perlis in the tunnel, leading to the locker rooms underneath the stands at halftime. None of his encounter with the two Steelers coaches was recorded for posterity, however, but it probably included some of the chosen vernacular that one would commonly hear in the back alley of a Harlem gang fight. Denver came out in the third quarter as fired up as they had ever been at least all season long. Their defense put an abrupt halt to Pittsburgh's scoring during the third frame. In contrast, the Broncos offense began to open up, which resulted in another touchdown. Veteran Denver quarterback Craig Morton was banged up all week prior to the game, but he gutted it out nevertheless Morton hit his tight end Riley Odoms with a 30-yard touchdown pass, giving the Broncos a 21-14 lead. True to their winning pedigree, however, the Steelers managed to stage a comeback. Bradshaw drove his offense to the Denver one-yard line in the fourth quarter. From the doorstep of the Broncos' goal line, the Pittsburgh quarterback tossed a very short pass in the end zone for his tight end Larry Brown, whose catch tied the game once again, this time at 21-all. Then came the Steelers' turnovers, one right after the other. Both came via the thievery of Tom Jackson, who intercepted two Terry Bradshaw passes. Those miscues resulted in one of two Jim Turner field goals, which boosted Denver's lead to 27-21. But Jackson's second interception led to the play that ultimately won the game for the Broncos. It came when Morton lofted the ball deep for his slot receiver, Jack Dalbin, who had beaten reserve Pittsburgh defensive back Jimmy Allen on a corner route. Dalbin caught the ball over his shoulder and just inside the corner of the end zone. The Mile High Stadium crowd went, well, the mile high. Dalbin's touchdown gave Denver the insurance that they needed to post a 34-21 win. It was the very first playoff victory in the 18-year history of the Broncos franchise. And even though memory would be eclipsed of that game the following week when Denver claimed an AFC championship, their triumph over the Steelers on Christmas Eve of 1977 would always be declared as the team's first ever win in the NFL playoffs. Now, the trivia question for this episode, besides Jack Dalbin, What other starting wide receiver played for the 1977 Denver Broncos? I'll give you a hint. He uh, also played for another team before the Broncos, and that other team was also an old AFL team. We'll uh, give you the answer on Facebook if you chime in with that. Thanks a lot for listening to another episode of Pro Football in the 1970s. I'm your host, Joe Zagorski, and we'll see you on the flip side. Take care. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com.
put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand. And that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Oh, that's a nice one. College football, 1923. Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great On the that. next kickoff, who would end up as returner but Harry Wilson? Wilson dodged at least a half dozen Recall the greatest moments in sports history or just your own personal favorite with Row One Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. When the gun started to mark the Penn State 14, Navy Zero. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.